most of you are in them already. Thank you. So um, uh, for the next uh, um, session, we'd like to uh, initiate our combatant command surgeons panel on interoperability um, and a little bit of a transition from our, our international speakers earlier. And this panel will be um, led and chaired by Major General Nadia West. Major General West is the Joint Staff Surgeon, and in that role, she is the advisor to the chairman of our Joint Chiefs of Staff. Um, and also in that role, she acts as a coordinating body for all of our combatant command surgeons and, and their voice in Washington, D.C. Major General West. All righty, thank you and good morning. Um, and I'd like to again welcome everyone to this, uh, to this uh, great forum and I appreciate AMSIS for um, sponsoring this and asking us to participate. Um, also would like to add a warm welcome to our international partners and our colleagues who've traveled um, some very great distances to be here today. Um, and the topic on interoperability, um, how timely is that? Just with the first two or three presentations that we've had this morning, you understand um, how important that is um, for, our, uh, for our discussion. Um, world events demonstrate almost on a daily basis why we must achieve interoperability on, on multiple levels whether it's exchanging patient information between our military facilities and our Veterans Administration hospitals, or um, as you've seen today, working with our uh, interagency colleagues um, for the West African uh, Ebola response, and also in providing treatment to our injured service members in the deployed environment and part of our, uh, as part of our coalition um, with our international partners. And so it's clear interoperability has to be more than just a catchy term that we use in our, our PowerPoint presentations. Uh, it's, it's something that we have to definitely strive for every day in every aspect of what we're doing if we have to work with others outside of our own organizations. So I'm really delighted to host this panel of very sage medical leaders that we have here um, today with us. Um, uh, who serve in their roles as, uh, co as their command surgeons for their combatant commands. And I'm sure those gentlemen uh, know a thing or two about uh, interoperability. Um, so I'll go on to the next, next slide here, who is the disclosure, basically no disclosures here. And um, you can see here who the command surgeons that will be speaking in the order here. And, and for the compressed time that we have, um, they'll each introduce themselves as they come up. Um, I also have some slides that uh, briefly um, uh, define the role. My role is the joint staff surgeon, but I really want to minimize that so we can get, uh, get my colleagues up here to talk about that. Um, so we'll get started, and at the end, I would just like to say before I forget, uh, if there are any questions at the end, there will be, uh, we ask that you put them forward to the website that will be posted, and then we'll um, entertain the questions through that, uh, through that mechanism. So as mentioned before, as the, as the Joint Staff Surgeon, I am the uh, medical advisor to the chairman, and I also serve as the staff member for the, for the uh, Chiefs of Service and the CNO when they are convened together as a body um, in their role as the uh, Joint Chiefs of Staff. Um, and I also serve on the, uh, the NATO um, uh, committee as the uh, U.S. representative to COMEDS. And in that inter interface, definitely the, uh, the discussion of interoperability and standardization um, comes through. Um, again, I'll go very quickly through the slides and turn it over to my colleagues. Again, this, uh, the slide here designates um, the chairman's instruction that, that defines my role. Um, as a representative to NATO, um, responsible for ensuring that the appropriate U, uh, and consistent U.S. positions are promoted through within the um, NATO organization. Um, and I won't read them all to you. I'll just let you take a look at the last two bullets there. And then the question of why standardize. We, I mentioned that briefly before. Um, you, you might get a, a structure that looks like this uh, um, if you don't uh, have some mechanism of standardization and interoperability with, again, those that you have to work with. Um, and again, this is why we standardize. I mean, our, um, my colleague who just presented gave a great definition of interoperability, and um, it's exactly the same that you see here. Why do we need to do that? Um, what is interoperability? And again, ability to act together coherently and effectively, and that's why this is so critical. And this is just an example of some of the uh, military committee organization um, that uh, we have in NATO 
um, of all the different standardization committees. And you can see here all of the different um, areas and domains where efforts to standardize as much as possible among the, our NATO and partner nations is occurring. And again, from everything um, from you know, medical ethics um, to uh, patient movement to hospitalization, so all these different areas where it's, it's clear that we need to have um, standardization among our clinical practices as well as some of the administrative functions that we do together as a coalition. So I'll stop here and then turn that over to my um, colleague here, uh, Rear Adm or Admiral Chen, who's going to provide uh, an update on his area. Well, good morning and aloha. Uh, General West, thank you for uh, inviting me to be a part of this, uh, this panel. Uh, my name is uh, Admiral Colin Chin. I am the command surgeon for uh, U.S. Pacific Command, and I've been in that position in Honolulu, Hawaii for the past uh, year and a half. And, uh, and great to be back here, uh, back here in D.C., although I'm looking forward to going back to the 70-degree uh, weather uh, in Hawaii uh, in a couple days. Um, so in PACOM, uh, we look at interoperability as, as critical for our mission uh, in many regards because of the vast size of the, of the area. You know, it, it encompasses 52% of the world, has over 50% of the world's population with uh, multiple countries, multiple time zones, and uh, interoperability, our ability to work uh, together in, in many uh, areas uh, as allows us to achieve the PACOM commander's goals of, of maintaining uh, peace and security in the region. Because there are uh, areas for potential conflict in the area. Also, as, as we well know, in, in the Pacific area, uh, disasters can occur uh, at any time. As well as, uh, even though right now the world's uh, effort is on the Ebola uh, crisis in West Africa, in, in PACOM, we also are very concerned about, still concerned about avian influenza and other uh, uh, um, uh, emerging infectious diseases that, that may occur. So the ability to synergistically uh, work together is very important. And the way we look at that is through three lenses. First, it's U.S. joint interoperability, meaning working together with our, our services the Army, the Navy, the Marine Corps, uh, the Air Force. So that's, that's one lens. And then another important lens is working uh, together with our partner uh, military medical departments in our, our allied and partner nations in the Pacific. And then finally, uh, working uh, with our interagency partners in, in the U.S. government for a whole of government approach uh, to, uh, to interoperability. So let me uh, sort of drill down a little bit more on those, on those three areas. So in terms of, of joint interoperability, uh, there's uh, many areas in which uh, we're able to achieve that. And that begins with our, our medical treatment facilities in the area. We have nine uh, uh, MTFs, uh, both uh, Army, uh, Navy, and Air Force. And increasingly, uh, we are, uh, those, those medical facilities, which in the past were very service specific, and, and, and uh, uh, took care of um, spe service-specific issues, we are now uh, working jointly, and even the staffs in many of these hospitals are, are joint. In particular, uh, Tripler Army Medical Center, uh, based in Honolulu, uh, uh, also U.S. Naval Hospital Okinawa, in Okinawa, in which we, in the Air Force is, is providing uh, critical support with our uh, NICU uh, there, and then uh, joint uh, uh, base uh, Elmendorf Richardson in, in, uh, in Alaska. So those are three great examples of how we are working at, at the MTF area in a, in a, in a joint way. Also uh, in, in PACOM, uh, following the lead that, uh, that occurred in Central Command when they established in 2005 a joint uh, trauma, theater trauma system, we realized that that's also important in, in the Pacific theater, again, because of the uh, large distances, time and distance that we have to face, and also having to deal with uh, a significant amount of ocean. Now, how do we, um, it's, it's critical, if we were to have, uh, that we establish a, a system, a trauma system, so that we can deliver the best uh, care for patients that, that may occur both in peacetime or in conflict. So we have established that, that program over the past year, and again, it, it is a joint effort. 
with, again, with our, our military treatment facilities, with the, uh, the components, as, as well as, again, the, the TRICARE system, and, 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 uh, and, and TRANSCOM uh, is working uh, uh, very well. We also have a uh, bl blood program, which, again, is joint, uh, which, again, is, is a critical need if, and for uh, contingency purposes. And then in, in uh, uh, training exercises that we do uh, with, with the components. And a good example would be something that I, that I just attended in Japan last month, which was exercise uh, Keen Sword, which was on Yokota Air Base, in which they wanted to test the, the feasibility of an Army cash hospital, which currently is uh, 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 stationed in a, in a, uh, uh, a depot about two hours away on, 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 uh, by land uh, from Yokota, we thought it would be more efficient to test the concept of having that cache right at their head uh, in, in Yokota. We did that, and it, it has been very uh, successful. For, so those are uh, some, some examples of joint uh, interoperability with our components. Uh, next, then, would be uh, how are we working interoperability with, with our uh, allied and partner nations. And here I, I've, I've got some examples. And, and uh, HADR, Humanitarian Assistance Disaster Relief, is a significant area in, in the Pacific AOR. We sort of joke that it's not when, if, it's, it's when are we going to have a disaster uh, that we're going to have to respond to. A year ago today, uh, uh, Typhoon Haiyan uh, rolled through uh, the Philippines, and, and we had to respond to it. And as I speak right now, there is another typhoon that is heading towards the same area. And so uh, we are always um, uh, on the alert for a, uh, for a disaster. And so we work very closely with our partner nations. A great example of that uh, was uh, this year, in which uh, the, rim, the rim pack exercise, the rim of the Pacific exercise, which is the largest naval exercise in the world, it's every other year in Honolulu, uh, we, they invited uh, 22 uh, partner nations that participated, and this year was the first time in which there was a significant medical piece to RIMPAC. So 15 of our, our partner nations sent medical representatives, the first time the People's Republic of China participated, and they sent their hospital ship, the Ark Peace. We likewise uh, uh, sent the USNS Mercy, and as you see in the picture there, uh, they had exercises, the medical staffs on both hospital ships with the uh, medical staffs of the other uh, partner nations, um, had subject matter exer exercises on the ships, uh, had uh, medical symposiums on the ships, and then, as you see, they went out to sea and we had crew swaps, medical teams uh, from both all the nations that are participating went out. And I think this is important because, again, I mentioned the disasters, and I think there's going to be at some point in the future a major disaster in the Pacific in which uh, we're going to be asked, both China, the U.S., and other nations are going to be asked to respond, and we may have to send both hospital ships. I think it's good now to, to train together, learn how we operate, uh, and so that we can be more effective if we are asked to, to work in the future. So that's a, just a, good, a great example of, of interoperability as it relates to humanitarian assistance and disaster relief. And I'm going to, in the interest of time, I'm going to go on to my... Uh, my next thing, and then how do we work from a whole of government perspective with interoperability? And let me talk about our blood safety program, which in 2009 we've been working with uh, the governments of Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam uh, to help them develop a national blood safety program. Uh, from, from the ground up, so they have a full spectrum program. It's uh, you know, their whole of government, so it's not just a military to military effort, it's a military to civi civilian, which includes their national Red Cross and the international Red Cross, and we've had great success with that program, so a good example there. And then I'll, in the middle, you see malaria elimination, although uh, the malaria problem is probably greater in AFRICOM, but we have a, a significant problem in the Mekong area in which there's a new strain of falciparum malaria, which is resistant to standard therapy, and it's centered in the border regions of Myanmar and Thailand and in the border areas in Cambodia. And so there is a whole of government effort led by the uh, Global Fund, the President's Malaria Initiative, World Health Organization, and the uh, Gates Foundation, and they have approached us at PACOM to assist in getting the militaries of the regions to work with their ministries of health so they can have a national malaria elimination program. So that's another uh, example of how, again, on a whole government pro uh, 
uh, uh, perspective, we are trying to all work together. And finally, you've heard uh, uh, and during this conference many references about the international health regulations. Again, we've been approached to assist, and again, in a whole of government effort, a U.S. government effort to assist uh, our partner nations in their effort to achieve IHR uh, compliance. So that, in a nutshell, is what we're doing in PACOM, and I uh, look forward to any questions you may have of me. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm Dave Weiss, the Command Surgeon for U.S. Africa Command. Uh, this is my first AMSIS meeting, so Vice Admiral Cowan, thank you and hats off to you and your crew for pulling this off. But, uh, I've had a really uh, excellent time here, a lot of great topics, so thank you. Uh, this morning, you know, our theme is interoperability. And so interoperability uh, starts with a group of, or system who's committed to solving a shared challenge or an issue. And so oftentimes it's a group of the willing, sometimes it can be a group of the coerced, but uh, for international engagements, you need to have a group of the willing. Um, and so it, it, it relates, as Admiral Chin mentioned, to, uh, you know, within U.S. government agency activities, uh, health-related activities, but also in African partner uh, nation activities as well. And so uh, oftentimes, you know, similar values can come together with often very different approaches. And so obviously a way to standardize those and work together and, and synergize is, is, is obviously um, the most important ta task. And so uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about our uh, malaria task forces. Uh, the malaria task force was initiated prior to my arrival on U.S. AFRICOM by Brigadier Gen General Miller, if he's here, still here, but his group started the East Africa Malaria Task Force after the Africans asked for assistance. And so they wanted to have a, assistance and expertise in fighting malaria. At the time, uh, for the U.S. Uh, mission, the uh, African Union mission in Somalia, it was a number one or number two cause of morbidity and mortality in, in troops that were uh, working in Somalia and, and two contributing countries. So they asked for this. And so, uh, and in addition, uh, we had a, a country in West Africa where at one point in time, a peacekeeping operation with the U.S. government, they, about half of their troops couldn't deploy based on uh, the fact that they had malaria or some other preventable disease. So the Africans asked for that, for this. It's, it's a regional approach. Uh, for uh, a task force, which I think is one of the uh, G8, the global health engagement best practices. And so it starts with the uh, Africans partner nations bringing their uh, malaria programs for, for review and assessment. And uh, they, own, they perform their own gap assessments. And we invite other U.S. agency partners uh, to participate and see where folks can contribute. And so far we have 15 nations in the initiatives and we're, our training initiatives um, uh, are, di are divided into five pillars, uh, which look into different aspects of malaria programs. And so our, our concept is train the trainers, and so far we've been able to cut quadruple the amount of Africans trained by Africans after initiating the program. Uh, one example of interagency uh, kind of shared values, USAID runs a presidential malaria initiative, and so a lot of that funding for PMI goes right to the host nation ministries of health, Oftentimes, the ministries of defense for a partner nation do not get any of that funding. So we've worked with them to try to make the funds available to partner, African partner nations. Uh, but it's something, it's ongoing effort to kind of do that and make sure that that happens. We'll be uh, incorporating a regional approach for the Outbreak Response Alliance, which our first meeting is in February. But this is a group, again, for a regional approach where you have gap assessments to assert a problem uh, or outbreaks. And this is a some of the uh, efforts after the Ebola crisis, some of the unaffected countries that we're helping. And obviously they're gonna bring uh, their assessments of their own military programs to the actual engagement and we'll see where we can invite other U.S. partners to attend as well. Uh, the Outbreak Response Alliance is based upon the framework of the international health regulations and how that's operated. So uh, again, we've invited a lot of other U.S. government agencies uh, to the first meeting in February, so we look forward to this initiative. Another uh, initiative within U.S. Africa Command is the Disaster Preparedness Program, and a lot of our partners from the Center for Disease and Humanitarian Assistance Medicine Group is participates in this. But it involves over 20 countries and has a uh, 
the ability to, after being asked to help a country develop a disaster preparedness plan and work out a written plan where they can uh, organize to uh, respond to a disaster. And our interest is obviously having the military, uh, host nation militaries participate in these uh, disaster preparedness plans. This is an example here. Recently we've had a uh, infection control course in Gabon where we uh, asked to come in and provide sort of a standardized approach and how you handle a, a military hospital in Ebola outbreak. This is a well-received course uh, and DEMO offered this course uh, uh, in the setting of, of Gabon. It, it was a very positive experience. But again, it's about tr training the trainers in the sense of having these uh, folks who initially train go and, and train uh, other partners. And last slide, this is a part of our casualty evacuation program uh, in Niger, basically where the Nigerian government asked for assistance in developing a CASIVAC program and working with Spe Special Operations Command uh, Africa and the 1206 funding for counterterrorism, we were able to establish this program and actually test the program in an operation or exercise and it's actually uh, working today. That's all I have. Open your questions. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Colonel Mark Mavi, the CENTCOM Command Surgeon. General West, thank you for the invitation to be a part of today's panel discussion. I'm going to begin with this slide, and I'm going to take a slightly different approach to my discussion today, and not talk too specifically about particular health engagement activities within our AOR, but to approach this from a little bit more contextual standpoint. When General Austin first came to CENTCOM as our commanding general uh, nearly two years ago, one of the first things that he really put forth in front of the staff was, was this graphic. And we call this our 432 slide. And I think it really captures the complexities of the CENTCOM area of responsibility. And whereas Admiral Chin spoke to the fact that they're responsible for 50% of the world's land mass and population, it seems like we get about 50% of the world's problems. And I think one only has to open up uh, a newspaper or turn on their TV or, or your computer and see the ways in which these different areas of our conflicts, confrontations, and situations are manifesting themselves on a daily basis and are presenting unique challenges for our national security. And every problem, I really describe it as one of those 20-sided dices and understanding uh, every, trying to influence operations and achieve our national objectives within the AOR uh, is a very complex endeavor. This slide has really become a foundational cornerstone for General West and the rest of the staff in, in, in formulating our theater strategy and then our theater campaign plan. And it's really that theater campaign plan in how we then go forth and execute and begin on the path towards interoperability. But I think the broader context of this, and, and I, I really view interoperability as an endpoint to medical security cooperation, which then gives us combined medical effects in the battle space to support our commander's objectives. And I look at this really across a couple of dimensions. When, when General West asks us, what does it mean to be interoperable for a COCOM? And oftentimes, I think we pay, we, we really tend to focus our, our energies and efforts and our attention in that upper right hand quadrant of this slide on those highest level orders of, of our international partners and achieving interoperability. But it takes an awful lot of work to get to that point. And sometimes that starts very near and close to home and sometimes we, we jump over that in, in terms of even within our own forces, uh, even in the total force and within the joint force. Having said that, I will never miss an opportunity uh, in any large group that I'm in to not point out the fact uh, that those of you in the audience and those whom you represent here today within our military health system and as well as with our joint partnerships and our coalition partnerships that have been developed in 10 years of, of constant conflict, there is not a more effective effect on the battlefield that is more integrated for our commanders than medical care. Not one, be it jointly or across a coalition. 
our medics are, are, are doing things on, on such an integrated level that is not achieved anywhere in none of, any other line of operation in support of our commanders. That certainly doesn't say that we don't have continued room for improvement. It gets increasingly complex as we get into that interagency level of, of cooperation. And for those of you who were uh, in this morning and, and were participating and listening in on the Ebola lectures, as well as what uh, uh, Captain Weiss just talked about and some of where his current intentions are in Africa, and, and interagency has two dimensions to it, interagency within our own government, and then interagency as well, dealing with a lot of our NGOs um, on the world health stage. And then lastly, coalition, which in my mind is really more of a mill-to-mill -mill type of an engagement. Moving left to right, what are those levels of, of interoperability that leads us to interoperability? Again, we can start with just building partnerships. And oftentimes, that's where we must begin, particularly as we are approaching new countries and in new ways, sometimes with partners who have, at, in most recent history, actually been adversaries of ours. You have to begin by establishing that goodwill and rapport, and we sometimes can be those medical ambassadors to open those doors, either for future medical security cooperation or cooperation in other domains as well. The next step to that is to be begin building those partners' capacities. And that's probably where we spend the preponderance of our time, particularly in our AOR, as many of our partner nations within the region have fairly small and somewhat undeveloped, uh, not only military structures, but in particular military medical structures as well, and helping them to organize, train, and equip to develop their own capabilities. So again, we do lots of work in that regard, and that covers the spectrum from a lot of very tactical level engagements, battlefield care, TCCC, combat lifesaver. Those types of activities are going on throughout our theater all the time, and those are very much meeting the needs of those countries with where they're at in their own development. And then with others, on the global health stage, we actually have a couple of nations in our region Kazakhstan and Jordan, who are signatory members to the Global Health Initiative, and we're doing a lot of work with them in the in arenas of biosurveillance, and as well with other countries within our region who are not yet signatories to that plan as well. But it's really that last and final stage is really interoperability. And as General West just showed you in one of her earlier slides in the definition of interoperability, that really leads to execution is really now being able to go forth in, in any theater of operation and either standing shoulder to shoulder uh, with any of our partners and, and to be able to work together to achieve those combined medical effects. When you talk about global health engagement, oftentimes the, the vocabulary uh, goes back to, to words such as ways, means, and ends. And again, moving across that spectrum of building partnerships to building capacities to interoperability, again, those are just some specific examples within our theater, the ways in which we're, we're doing that on the lower end, doing those more traditional types of engagement activities that many of us grew up with early in our careers of doing med rets and med capes, to then focusing on more specific training courses to develop specific skill sets within our partners, and then really, in the interoperability stage, either in operations or in exercises where we're actually demonstrating those capabilities. I think the means are, are important to acknowledge because the, getting after this, uh, you, you need to know where the resources are to go to achieve each of these. And they're somewhat different. And it's important to know that because, again, we are part of that larger theater campaign plan. Uh, we need to be tied in with our ops and plans folks. We need to be comp competing with them for those same resources to be relevant and to be embedded within those larger theater campaign objectives. And I think the challenges as, as we look forward in, in building these medical security cooperation plans and our supporting annex cues of any theater cooperation plan, it's important to think not in just isolated instances, but to start building a longitudinal plan, a continuity effort that progresses such that the things that we've done in the past are shaping the things that we are doing within our current year of operation, which will then inform the things that we will do in the coming years as well. 
as within our own structures, as we've moved away from large set piece uh, military structures, be it operational or medical, and adapted more agile and responsive capabilities. And given that that is where we're headed, we're also going to need to and work with our partners to develop those similar types of what we call plug and play uh, small set pieces so that we can interoper uh, be interoperable with our partners in the emerging challenges that lie ahead for each of us. And then again, understanding what does right look like? How do we measure this as we work on these building partnership and building partner capacity activities and then assessing ourselves in, in operational type exercises? Did we achieve those objectives? Um, and understanding as well that uh, as we are working in the international level, those ranges of capabilities are important. There are different levels of standard of care that some of our partners will have. So what does right look like for them? Um, and again, are we going to be working within a shared facility where this becomes very much, can be a potential friction point, less so if we're working in parallel but part of a larger system. So again, it's what can you live with because at the end of the day, someone's going to have to assume command and control over that medical enterprise, particularly if you're operating within a single shared facility. So again, as you're bringing partners together with different trainings and, ex and levels of experiences, Again, what are you willing to live with in terms of that level of operability to make sure that the care we're delivering to all of those patients who are then charged to take care of are being adequately met? Flag officers, uh, equivalent, uh, civilian equivalents, other teammates, it's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you for the opportunity uh, to uh, talk about something that I don't have significant financial uh, relationship, but I surely have a lot of passion um, for. And I want to begin my presentation on the far left side, thanking the services and the finances from uh, Army, Navy, Marine Corps, Air Force, and Special Operations for making the uh, international health engagement occur. Uh, and we do things on the right-hand side, thanks to those capabilities. Towards the middle there is a map that's very important because European command is considered kind of sleepy, very stable, yet we account for about half of the bad news stories on CNN on any given day, uh, given our support to uh, AFRICOM and just a little less so to uh, CENTCOM. Uh, green button. So uh, in a little bit of context, I'm going to talk about um, um, moving from the bottom left uh, over to the right. Uh, we're doing a lot of pre-hospital uh, care development as well uh, for enforced health protection as well as uh, point of injury and then what we call role one in NATO, uh, which is primary care and, uh, and um, battalion aid station spectrum, a little into role two with damage control surgery and then all the way to the right with um, rehabilitation uh, capabilities. Realize that you don't have to do the uh, Maswell hierarchy in the order uh, from bottom to up. You can uh, go right to self-actualization sometimes, such as rehabilitation, uh, without all the intervening steps. Just to give you an idea, Bagram and Longstool are considered role three facilities. Uh, now, I, I want to stop here just to tell you that I define interoperability in three words, measurable, effectiveness, together. And I have three uh, points to per perhaps simplistically present to you. Success takes uh, a large teams, more than two years. The second is that it's an art form and has almost nothing to do with our experiences taking care of patients from our own nations. And the uh, third thing is that engagements are nice. Interoperability is terrific, but fabulous is regional interoperability because we're all running out of money and people to do what we used to do. Uh, just a quick point, uh, there's almost 20 United States partners uh, with uh, almost the equivalent number of countries. There are some states that do two countries, and my hat's off to them for the long, the long haul in doing this so well. I've taken some of the ideas of, my, of the prior speakers and put them in these little bubbles. Uh, left, bottom, is uh, the notion that we need to do the total force, including our reserve components. Moving up slightly from there, it's uh, the jointness that I already gave great credit to, including the state partnership, for prog program, uh, state partnership program. And then uh, there towards the top, it is sort of a pinnacle effort, is our interagency uh, initiatives. Just two days ago, I was with the US ambassador, nine time zones from here, uh, and his interagency 
advocacy team talking about multiple drug resistant tuberculosis. Now, usually what we focus in on is that partner nation, that bilateral relationship with the United States. That's great, but as I said, we in UCOM are starting to focus a little further to the right at regional cooperation, and you've seen some of the prior speakers speak to it. And then, of course, as soon as you get out of a partner nation, IHR and other things, we get into international organizations. So, next slide shows the uh, ideas from bottom left that we do a lot of patient movement involving the reserve component and of course all the services. I already gave credit to SPP. And then I mentioned uh, towards the top left hand side there about uh, uh, things involving infectious diseases, whether preventive or otherwise. So I'm going to focus for the rest of the time on mostly the blues. Uh, there are three regions that we talk about uh, at UCOM in terms of requiring uh, development in a significant way. That's uh, the Baltics in the north, uh, the Balkans, especially the, uh, East, the West Balkans, and, uh, and the Caucasus. Of course, a, third, a fourth region would be the 28-nation uh, North Atlantic Treaty Organization Alliance. So the areas that we focus on are these three categories. The first one is really a mill-mill engagement. However, in many of our partner nations, it doesn't take long for that capability to quickly become a civilian, an academic, uh, or even an NGO capability. And those are those role one and role two things that I mentioned, and that aeromedical um, capability that's so important, especially as countries get, uh, get larger or further away from, uh, from for where they're engaging. Uh, I will talk a little bit about the Balkans, NATO exercises, and uh, I will just make a plug now that the Baltic Medical Task Force may soon look like the Balkan Medical Task Force, as uh, you will see in, in, a, in a slide. Uh, in the next category, talk about that self-actualization, wounded warrior programs. So we're on our third one. There's a possible fourth one uh, coming up. Uh, Georgia is the longest lasting. There'll be a slide on that towards the end. Estonia, incredible success from the people that started uh, Skype. Uh, they started after one of the programs, it finished well before them, and already are international offering care to Ukraine as well as their neighbors. Um, the, um, that, that second sub-bullet there, Burn Care in Moldova, wonderful success. Uh, they contributed 45%. This country is considered the poorest of all the European countries, yet they provided 45% of the financing and subsequently eight years of self-sustainment of this capability that we helped to do together. And they have increased the survival by 100%. I think that's a terrific measure of effectiveness. In that last category, it's about infections mostly to date, uh, TB, Ebola, and HIV. HIV AIDS. Now, uh, on to the Balkan Medical Task Force. One measure of effectiveness, I would argue, is who you please that is very high brained and uh, in status. And that is the Secretary of Defense uh, considers this a very important topic for him. And United States Air Forces Europe is the component most linked to it. It's about six of the eight Western Balkan nations. And they want to be able to respond to their own disasters. As they said to me once, it's great to meet an American when they're not bombing us. Um, so, you know, we have made some progress. But uh, they also said, who better to respond to the Balkans than Balkan people? And uh, so we've been trying to help them out. Norway has been the lead financer and organizer of this thing. The uh, CONOPS concept of operations is in two months to be signed, and then the full capabilities, um, hopefully in 2016. Now, three countries bring stuff and staff. Three just have staff. They're very small countries. What does it look like? Well, uh, there's the Macedonian deployable hospital. Here's the Serbian deployable hospital. Different shapes, but in the end, good health care. All right, let me shift to NATO. There was a, a pretty exciting event where 11 nations of uh, NATO came together just a little over a year ago in Germany and, um, and put together something that spanned role one, role two. But for the first time, it was not parallel play or we were hosted in a shared facility. Rather, the facility was very different. If you look at the different red crosses on these vehicles, you can tell how many different vehicles were put together. The, to give you an idea, what was uh, pretty traditional as you get role one care from a variety of role one capabilities, ground ambulance and air ambulance by other countries, no problem. The United States provided the, that gorgeous helicopter towards the top. 
uh, and thanks to the leadership of uh, one of our flag officers in the audience. Um, but the idea was if you need a decon, the Italian uh, capability there towards the bottom right is where you went. If you did not need decon, you went to a German capability, and there would be multinational staffing, not a surprise. What was a surprise, you would then go in for a surgical uh, suite to either Czech, French, or Hungarian surgeons and anesthesiologists. When you finished with that, you'd go to a Dutch ward. If you needed mental health work, that was Czech. If you needed a lab work done on them, that was Italian. And so it goes with intensive care unit pharmacy and so on. It was truly multinational. It was no longer parallel play. Now, there were lots of lessons observed and documented. We'll see if they're learned uh, with our next uh, um, uh, uh, events, encounters together. So, uh, shifting to the future, in 2015, the Czech uh, government is kind enough to be the host for two more. The top one there is more of a, a um, natural bio threat circumstance. It's going to be sm smaller than the one I mentioned earlier. And then another exercise that does not uh, belong to COMEDS uh, is uh, a, probably going to be a man-made sea burn uh, focus. And uh, we hope uh, that NATO, uh, that our nations will be able to play a larger role in even a bigger exercise in the near future. Uh, so uh, my second to last slide, uh, Georgia. This is interoperability, short, short of. Uh, hopefully it's going to be a regional benefit at some point. But uh, its, its measures of effectiveness is uh, the amputee care capability there is of interest to the President of the United States. And it's clearly a new capability. That's pretty good measures. And uh, we are also doing other things there with uh, our components from the Army and the Air Force there. We're also working on multiple drug-resistant tuberculosis and nursing school, both physical and academic aspects. And then to go back to the concept of engagements. Uh, this is just a quick tally of three kinds. There is multilateral, many nations, and many services, US military services, uh, perhaps involved, uh, down to uh, just a bilateral, just another country in the United States using multiple services, uh, including uh, eight different countries there. And then uh, shown towards the bottom there is the, again, just US and, and uh, one other nation, uh, but uh, there with just one of our services. So I hope I uh, gave you some uh, insight as to how UCOM sees interoperability. Thank you for your time. Look forward to your questions. Good morning, everybody, and welcome. Uh, I'm Colonel Jay Young. I am the deputy surgeon for NORAD in NORTHCOM. Uh, the, our surgeon was not able to come out due to a change of command at NORTHCOM. General Jacoby is retiring after 36 years of service, and Admiral Gortney is going to be taking his place. So we have a lot of changes going on there. Uh, NORTHCOM is unique from the other COCOMs in that we provide support to North America, which includes Canada, Bahamas, Mexico, support uh, through our partner nations in North America. Uh, since we work primarily here in the United States, our interoperability is with the federal government, with the various agencies of the federal government. Anytime NORTHCOM does something, it is in support and under the direction of a lead federal agency. So we work with the militaries of the Bahamas, Canada, Mexico, and all of the services and reserve components of the United States. We also work with um, uh, over 60 uh, government and non-governmental organizations. The interoperability is so tight there because the need is so great. If we have a natural or man-made disaster in the United States, we cannot be late to that medical need. Because if we're late, that means that people are suffering and people are dying, our citizens. And that's not acceptable to NORTHCOM. So all the planning that we do is done in conjunction, repeatedly, constantly, and exercised with our, with our federal partners. We have over 60 uh, partners that we work with. 45 of those different organizations have liaisons in our headquarters at NORTHCOM. Emergency response in the United States is built off of the National Response Framework. And in that, there are 15 different emergency support functions that must be addressed. 
The primary one that we deal with on the medical side is the health and medical services. Generally, that lead federal agency is going to be health and human services. But when you take a look at these other ESFs, you notice that medical has a very significant role in several of these others. Transportation, the evacuation, the tracking of, of medical casualties, mass care. Even though those individuals don't need hospitalization, there's still a requirement to make sure that the sanitation for mass care of individuals is covered. That those individuals who are not needing medical care, but, are, but do have chronic conditions. Do they have the medications that they need to not come into the health care system? Hazardous materials. If there is either an intentional or an accidental leak of chemical agents, or we have a slow-moving bio or pandemic issue, what do we do with, those, with that uh, uh, contaminated material? How do we provide for the force health protection and public health protection of the United States? You know, we've talked about Ebola. For an Ebola patient, they can lose up to 10 liters of fluid a day. How do you manage that? Okay. And also for the food and drug uh, of agricultural, uh, food departments of agriculture, uh, that's, a, that's a very serious issue. Do we have, uh, in a disaster situation, do we have clean water? Do we have appropriate food supplies? Are we monitoring any potential bio issue that is coming into the United States? A very good example of the food, uh, criticality of food is uh, earlier this year, we had a porcine diarrhea epidemic uh, that affected the central United States. Over a billion dollars of lost productivity was the result. Now this particular virus is only seen in one province in China. How did that virus get here to the US? Well, that's a good question. Right now, it looks like that came over through contaminated feed. But the bottom line is that that is a security risk to the United States. Bio is a significant security risk. Okay. Now, NORTHCOM has a seat on what's called BioWatch. It is a national system to look for any emerging uh, or sudden biological issue anywhere in the country. With that, we can be very proactive in what we do for force health protection or for response uh, to, uh, to an outbreak or in uh, a response to de uh, developing plans. With the changing climate, we're seeing increased issues with dengue hemorrhagic fever coming north. We see issues with Chagas disease. We see issues with chikigunya. Uh, take your pick, there's a whole variety. Just uh, today I read a report that there's another outbreak of H5N1 in China, okay? So we're always taking a look at that and making plans with our interagency partners on how do we respond to that so that we're not late to need. Earlier this year we had uh, ongoing issues with uncontrolled immigration into the United States. We were asked to support through FEMA, Border Patrol, and Health and Human Services the numbers of, of unaccompanied children coming into the United States. Children as young as five to 17 coming across the border with no parents. Now, we all know that uh, children always have their, their normal childhood illnesses, but we were asked to provide facilities on military installations. Okay, military installations are where we have our troops. The training of our troops, the force generation, the housing of our troops. If we bring individuals with potential uh, uh, contagious diseases onto our bases, well, we have to be very careful with that, okay? So in conjunction with Health and Human Services and Border Patrol, we identified screening areas for anybody coming across the border uh, to, be, to receive a health screening, to receive vaccinations for uh, flus, 
uh, and various other illnesses. And also a cooling off period to cover that uh, about 72 hours incubation period for varicella, chickenpox. Prior to those individuals, those unaccompanied children coming into DOD facilities, we didn't take care of these individuals medically in DOD. That was covered by Health and Human Services working on the military bases. But we still had the facilities. Uh, during that time period, very short time period, DOD supported nearly 7,800 unaccompanied children coming through the system. Over 65,000 unaccompanied children came in uh, to this country this year. And DOD supported Health and Human Services and Border Patrol with about 7,800. But even with those screenings that were done, we still see that we had, oh, about 14 varicellas. We had uh, uh, H1N1 coming in and getting into a DOD facility. We also had a very serious issue with a bacterial pneumonia, a young person coming into Naval Base uh, Ventura County, and we also had a typhus coming in. Uh, this individual was, uh, uh, had very few symptoms was but uh, had a long-term uh, chronic issue. It turned out that the individual was a carrier of typhoid. Okay, so those are all issues that we need to be very aware of and be proactive with our interagency partners to make sure that those individuals get the health care that they need, but we're also protecting the populations here in the United States. Okay? Another example, let's go to the next slide. In uh, early summer, we saw the uh, emergence of, of Ebola becoming more of an issue in West Africa. On the 1st of August is when we really started to take a look here in the U.S. about what capabilities did we have in case we had an outbreak here. And the bottom line was that we had a total of four institutions here in the United States that could care for Ebola patients. Well, we had four, and they're supposedly to have uh, a number of beds capable. In uh, the University of Nebraska, uh, they have 10 beds set aside for the capability. But in the last 10 years of them practicing for a situation like this, they have not had any. So they had uh, staffing and facility, staffing to, to take care of a patient for a total of two, even though they had 10 beds identified. So that's a gap that we identified. And based off of our experience with the unaccompanied children, we also realized that we needed to work with our, our federal partners to identify, number one, screening areas for individuals coming into the United States, additional hospital capabilities uh, for when these four uh, facilities, if we had a surge and they uh, became uh, overwhelmed, what are the next steps, what are the next hospitals in our country that uh, a highly contagious, highly contaminated patients can go to? What facilities can DOD provide for DOD members coming back from affected areas? And let's, let's take off of the Ebola off of this and put in uh, uh, contagious individuals with no medical countermeasures, no, no treatment for it, okay? So over the last couple of months, this is now what the uh, uh, DOD response looks like. We still have those four facilities that are available and they've been used. They are the first choice for any Ebola patient coming into the United States. But we also have five different uh, screening areas at international airports. These airports are the primary recipients of individuals coming from the West Africa. We have identified uh, additional hospitals, 30 additional civilian hospitals that are being evaluated by the CDC, uh, Centers for Disease Control, uh, to uh, accept Ebola patients. So, and when you take a look at the overall picture, uh, we now have a very good response to uh, 
uh, an Ebola outbreak here in the United States. On top of that, we've done some additional training in case Health and Human Services needs uh, uh, assistance. We've provided training for a 30-person team of hands-on providers to go wherever they're needed in the country if they're needed. Again, we don't want to be late to need. We want to have things ready and available and processes in place to get the, the support to where it needs to be as soon as possible. We've now run two of those courses. In fact, uh, we've invited uh, Canadian representatives, bah Bahamian representatives, and Mexican representatives to participate in that training. And I believe that there's uh, an individual from Mexico in the room today that uh, uh, participated in that hands-on Ebola patient care training. Canada has uh, uh, really stepped up to the plate as well. These are the hospitals in Canada that are capable of, of taking uh, Ebola patients. All of these hospitals are capable of doing uh, the rapid testing for Ebola to rule out, is this Ebola or is this another issue? All of the uh, tests are verified at the BSL-4 lab, um, biosurveillance laboratory uh, in uh, Winnipeg. But uh, in conjunction with uh, our support, uh, our partner nations, uh, we also are very concerned with, uh, with abilities throughout North America. And thank you very much for your time. Buenos días, uh, mi nombre es Coronel Rudy Cachuela y soy el director de Sanidad Militar para Comando Sur. Uh, good morning, um, I'm Colonel Rudy Cachuela and I'm the uh, command surgeon for uh, U.S. Southern Command. This morning I'm going to just take a couple of minutes to sort of tell you what we are all about in SOUTHCOM and uh, what our uh, priorities are in both overall engagement and in health engagement. Really, our vision inside the command is to continue to promote security, stability, and prosperity in Central South America and the Caribbean through partnership. And our mission is very simple. It's to be able to employ full spectrum military operations in support of U.S. national security objectives and to promote security cooperation within our region. For our international partners, U.S. Southern Command is the only command that truly and purely looks south. Um, we have uh, an area of responsibility that includes all of Central America and South America and all the Caribbean with the exception of uh, Puerto Rico and the Bahamas. Uh, we do closely collaborate and cooperate with Mexico uh, through uh, our partners in uh, Northern Command. We have 31 countries in our area, 15 sovereignties, and because we are all in the Western Hemisphere, we are connected economically and also culturally with the uh, U.S. being the second largest Spanish-speaking nation in the world, and it is projected by 2050 that 30 percent of the population in the United States will be Hispanic. And really the bottom line is because we are all in the Western Hemisphere, we share the same regional interests in security cooperation challenges. Our priorities as set forth by General Kelly, our combatant commander, are very simple. Number one is detainee operations. Two is to counter transnational organized crime. Three is to build partner capability and capacity and four is to plan and be able to respond to contingencies. We take that strategic plan and we look at it from a healthcare perspective and from the surgeon's office, we've developed a set of priorities that support the combatant commander's theater campaign plan. First and foremost, our priority is to protect the forces, protect the health of the U.S. forces that are in the South Come AOR. We are also there to provide health leadership, not only to the combatant commander and to the SOUTHCOM staff, but also to provide health leadership to our component 
and to engage in key leadership engagements with our healthcare counterparts and our partner nations throughout the SOUTHCOM area of responsibility. We focus on building cap capability and capacity in our partner nation military health systems so that they can provide internal defense to their nations, respond regionally to humanitarian assistance and disaster response contingencies, and also to engage in peacekeeping operations around the world. Some of our recent successes have been we brought forth the capability of tactical combat lifesaver uh, to the country of Peru, where they now have their own TCLS school. And they're able now to go up into Central America, where most recently they went up to El Salvador and taught the, the El Salvador peacekeeping operation soldiers getting ready to go to Africa uh, the skills of tactical combat life, lifesaver. With our Chilean brethren, um, we helped them build a combat casualty course. Um, and their C4 course is now a regional course where they invite other partner nations in both Central and South America to be able to learn the techniques and skills of combat casualty care. With our brothers in Colombia, we have uh, partnered with them in amputee care where they've established a system of taking care of, of their wounded warriors, particularly their amputees, uh, which is truly outstanding. Because we understand that health security is a key component to regional security, we not only engage with the ministries of defense, but we also engage with the ministries of health to continue to build partner capability and capacity in the healthcare systems. And finally, we're focused on biosurveillance and infectious disease response. We've had uh, great engagements, again, with the country of Peru. Um, we have brought forth the capability of a system called SAGES, which is a biosurveillance system, which they've now fully employed in their nation. And we are in, in the process of employing that system in the country of Honduras. In the South Com Surgeon's Office, our key role is to shape health engagements, to synchronize them, to prioritize them, and to focus all health-related events in the SOUTHCOM AOR. Again, we do this through partnership, both through the U.S. interagency and internationally, and with our partner nations. And I'm not going to go through that litany of alphabet soup there in the center, but that's just a small sampling of the folks that we partner with in order to achieve our objectives in the SOUTHCOM area of responsibility. And last but not least, we provide oversight and coordination of manpower and funding to be able to do health engagements in the SOUTHCOM AOR. Thank you. Good morning. My name is uh, Chris Torres, and I am the command surgeon at the U.S. Strategic Command. The U.S. Strategic Command is a functional command so therefore it doesn't have any geographic boundaries. However, our mission set is such that uh, if we do not succeed in it, we will have impact globally. Our mission sets include nuclear, space, cyberspace, and countering weapons of mass destruction. As a functional command, U.S. Strategic Command does not have assigned forces. So therefore, we work with joint task forces as outlined in this diagram. The joint task forces are normally, uh, during normal operations, are assigned to their respective service. The respective service has ADCON, uh, TACCON, and OPCON of the task forces. However, during contingencies, the, the TACCOM and OPCON is transferred to U.S. Strategic Command. Because of the way we're structured, it makes it uh, difficult for us to be able to carry out our missions without having, having good interoperability uh, within the, peop the personnel or organizations that work to make our mission successful. Uh, within U.S. STRATCOM, we have multiple partners to accomplish our mission set. As you can see here from the mission statement, again, the four mission sets that I talked, to, talked about previously. Our partners include uh, NATO, uh, as well as DOD, federal, state agencies, and the other combatant commands. 
To ensure interoperability, what uh, we have accomplished at the Stratcom is uh, to conduct exercises uh, through Global Thunder, Global Lightning. During these exercises, we go ahead and take the lessons learned in order to enhance our planning, in increase our mission effectiveness, and also to en enhance our communication across the forces that we control. In addition, uh, we also will work, very, work to, to enhance the infrastructure and systems in order to ensure at, uh, that there is clear communication across all, all parties involved in our mission. During my short tenure at, at U.S. Uh, Strategic Command, I've made several observations, two of which I will share with you today. Um, I feel there is a need for a single repository for worldwide and coincidence health surveillance and medical intelligence data. In our office, we get a lot of information coming to us, both open source and uh, secured, which make it difficult for us to determine the validity of, of the information that we're receiving in terms of its priority. Having such an uh, organization structure will help us in terms of being able to prioritize the information that we receive. Um, I believe that we are in the uh, right direction. We just had a um, biosurveillance baseline operational assessment that was done in early 2014. And through the results of that, of that uh, event, I believe we are in, we are in, the, in the right direction to achieve, the, achieve this in the future. The other area which I think requires em continued emphasis and oversight is the personal reliability program. This is a program that should have zero discrepancies. But we are human and we know that, that's, that zero discrepancies is the goal, but it's, it's hard to achieve. And through my experience with the Air Force Inspection Agency and also at STRATCOM, uh, there are times when we fall short. They're infrequent, but they do occur. And most of the time when they occur, it falls in the area of having the right person with the right training at, at the right place, and also with emphasis on attention to detail. Thank you very much. All right, I'm technically challenged. <laughs> but really, my name's Dave O'Brien. I'm from U.S. Transportation Command. Uh, my thanks to AMSIS and also to General West and her staff for allowing me to talk today. U.S. Transportation Command, like STRATCOM, um, is a functional command. We're, we're not a geographical command. At uh, U.S. Transportation Command, we, uh, we move people and things, or maybe we would say uh, we transport personnel and supplies in support of the Department of Defense and the uh, global operation. So today, what I thought I would do, trying not to repeat all the great words and efforts of my colleagues, <laughs> pretty challenging. I think it was a very comprehensive conversation so far. I will try not to repeat anything, and I'll probably um, edit some of the things I say as we go, so forgive me. Um, I'm going to actually try to illustrate some interoperability uh, and maybe more so with the federal interagencies as we talk about our recent uh, global health crisis in West Africa, Ebola. I know a lot of people have talked about that as well, so I'm just going to use that to, to illustrate a couple examples. Uh, it's kind of interesting that we're involved in a public health uh, crisis uh, again from the Department of Defense perspective. I remember it was just a few years ago we were helping out a, a great friend of ours in, in Japan with uh, Operation Tomodachi, another uh, public health disaster. And in terms of operability, uh, some of the groups that we worked with included Department of State, included the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, the, the Federal Administration, uh, Aviation Administration, uh, uh, the uh, Department of Energy. So uh, a lot of partners in, in uh, operations uh, with agencies that, as a 
Air Force guy, typically you don't work with. We've had a lot of chance to work with uh, the Centers for Disease Control, and this is, uh, and um, West Africa is the latest example. Uh, and we started off that effort really helping them, uh, working together to develop air transport guidelines for commercial air ambulances to move Ebola patients. This is similar to our previous efforts uh, with both uh, uh, SARS uh, as well as MERS-CoV, and uh, we welcome those opportunities to make the commercial uh, aviation industry uh, uh, interoperable along with the uh, Department of Defense evacuation capability. So in addition to uh, CDC, we're very uh, involved with the uh, Department of State uh, in West Africa, and one of our first efforts was to work through a number of medical evacuation scenarios. Uh, and then after that, uh, a lot of work with USAID. So USAID, uh, all about uh, helping uh, uh, nations overseas, and in fact, the capabilities of US Transportation Command uh, fit very nicely into the request into what's become a, a logistical battle against an infectious disease. Uh, I'll just illustrate one recent uh, uh, new twist, uh, something that we haven't done with the CDC before, and that was uh, to support uh, patient care in the United States. Uh, we've had a number of Ebola cases as you're probably well aware, uh, travelers coming back from uh, West Africa presenting to community hospitals in the United States, typically not prepared, uh, not a tier one infectious disease hospital. And one of the things that we've done for them, for the CDC, is to move personnel and to move lab specimens. So most recently we had a physician uh, present in a hospital in New York City. And in support of CDC in that community hospital, we moved uh, some CDC infectious disease specialists up to uh, the Bellevue Hospital and moved a blood specimen from New York City down to CDC where they could do some confirmatory testing that wasn't available in New York City at that time. It was all very ad hoc. I was talking to the uh, hotline down at CDC in a way I'd never imagined before, talking about passengers and getting them cleared so they could travel on an uh, Air Force uh, DV jet. We've established a new procedure in order to support them in the future, and, and uh, there's a very well-described process for them to work with us in the future. So that's another example of interoperability in a way that we might not have imagined a couple months ago. So I work with logisticians. In fact, some of my logistician friends would say that medical care is really just another uh, logistical maintenance activity for carbon-based life forms, for taking care of people. Isn't that a logistics activity? I fight that every day. Uh, but in fact, uh, a lot of their logistical capability is exactly what they need in Africa. And I thought I'd illustrate uh, how we have supported USAID and uh, in Liberia through some of the logistics activities that Transcom and Defense Logistics Agency um, have contributed thus far. So if you look at um, logistics movement, um, and I looked, at the, uh, I looked up this morning, in terms of uh, military airlift, we've brought about uh, 20,000 short tons of supplies out to Liberia at this point. Uh, and if you look at sea lift, and we just had two, um, two of our military sea lift vessels leave West Africa, and they brought about 80,000 short tons of equipment. Well, there's no, there's no real good thing to have all that supplies if you don't have a place to put them. So in support of that same effort, the Defense Logistics Agency went about creating and, and uh, leasing warehouse space in Liberia and in Senegal. And as you can see up there, there's well over 100,000 square feet of warehousing that they put in place. And that will all be supported by um, 
vehicles and distribution because it doesn't do any good to have supplies in a warehouse if you can't get them out to the Ebola treatment units where they're being used. We talked a little bit about Tyvek suits. They've become a, a new currency for medical logistics in West Africa. And we've gone through a lot of challenges. Uh, our Defense Logistics Agency, I think, has acquired close to half a million Tyvek suits thus far. They've actually adapted to that. And uh, now, literally, instead of those supplies routing through the United States, many of them are manufactured overseas. And they're being drop shipped. So literally, they will. Uh, they'll be uh, manufactured and shipped direct from overseas locations uh, to uh, Monrovia in order to uh, supply the large demand for them there. I thought I'd finish up with just a few observations about uh, the challenges of working with civilian organizations. We, we use different words. We use different stock numbers. We have different requirements, and we don't vet our requirements in similar ways. We don't use the same IMIT. We don't use the same information in computer systems. So it's taken a lot of workarounds. Uh, but I would say that professionalism is what has underlied our success. We've uh, sat down, talked through what everyone has needed, and found ways to adapt in order to get uh, the needs met overseas. And I think thus far, we're seeing some good successes. Much work to go. From a transportation perspective, uh, that's all I have to share with you today. So I think I'm turning this over to General West. Thank you very much. You. All right, thank you so much for that. And as you can see, um, hopefully the, the breadth of the um, COCOMs, uh, what a great presentation. A round of applause for all of our, our presenters. Thank you. So interoperability all around the globe, what a difficult uh, challenge that is. But um, and I apologize for running over. I know with the fire alarms and the delays, um, do we have time for any questions? Yes, ma'am, we've got time for two questions. OK. Um, thank you. We've had a lot of great questions posted um, uh, to the uh, forum. So those who don't get asked, please buttonhole your favorite uh, command surgeon afterwards. Uh, the first question is uh, for PACCOM, and it's how is time and distance factored into your responses and your plans? Can you hear me? OK, good. Uh, that's a significant uh, challenge for us is the, uh, the time and distance. I will use the example of the, um, the uh, typhoon last year in, in the Philippines. Uh, as you know, there was a, that was a you know, Category 5 uh, typhoon that, that uh, went through that, that country, uh, devastation uh, throughout the, the Taklaban area. And there was a significant uh, a medical uh, need to respond to that disaster. And so one of the major tools that we have in PACOM for that is the hospital ship which is uh, home ported in San Diego, California. The difficulty with that, so we activated uh, Mercy uh, almost immediately, Pac, Pac Fleet did that, but the challenge was that it takes 27 days to sail that ship uh, across the Pacific to the area. So we were able to get that sh uh, ship ready to go uh, within about three or four or five days, uh, but we never deployed it because of that um, 27 day. Uh, so that's a significant challenge. We're looking at other options in terms of trying to uh, maybe in the future forward deploy that uh, more forward. But that would be a good example of how time and distance affects us in PACOM. Thank you. And a final question, uh, going back to our, our good friend Ebola. Uh, as we leave the trauma world, um, we had a, an immature JTS and a trauma registry and great data collection. What's the plans for uh, the same in the non-trauma environment, particularly with Ebola? As regards, as regards collecting data. This, can you guys hear me okay? That's a great question. I, I think there's a lot of uh, U.S. government action regarding, uh, you know, biosurveillance activities in, in West Africa and other places, and I think that's a big focus, uh, certainly for the next several years. Uh, DITRA will be a um, defense threat reduction agency. It's probably going to have the come out with the uh, most available funding and resources to kind of lead those activities. Other agencies for biosurveillance include the USAID uh, working group. And so the, the plan, I think, overall is to try to find a way to develop an early response network and, and database, not so much for data tracking, but just to be, have a trigger 
to know when we need to respond or when, when we need to send res resources for help. So that's the plan. So there's not, I would say, uh, and the other U.S. government agencies involved in CDC as well, which has a pretty good network for certain countries for uh, biosurveillance activities regarding Ebola and, and the places that have outbreaks, they generally have folks deployed there. And then finally, you know, the World Health Organization has the GORN network for global out, um, outbreak response, which is a key player and, and was in West Africa as well for just the ability to detect and, and respond. Thanks. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, gentlemen. All right. So I believe this concludes the panel, and I do no need to turn it back over to our administrative support staff here. Anything, Dr. Fike? Okay. Okay. <laughs>